Order, order. This is Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee, and this is our latest hearing into the uh, UK music festival sector. Uh, today, we are joined in two panels by, in the first panel, Professor Carly McLaughlin, Professor of Climate and Energy Policy at the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research, and Robert Del Nia uh, from Massive Attack. We also have on our second panel. Professor Fiona Meesham, Director at The Loop, and Deputy Chief Constable Jason Harwin, National Police Chief's Council Lead for Drugs, and Assistant Chief Constable Justin Beebe, not Bieber, uh, Staffordshire Police. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, before we commence, I'm just going to go to the committee to see if there's any interests. Kevin Brennan. Uh, yeah, I am a member of the Musicians' Union and have received um, support at election time from the Musicians' Union. Thank you, Kevin. Is anyone else? No. OK. Our first questions will come from Kevin Brennan. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good morning uh, to our witnesses and uh, welcome. Um, perhaps, um, Professor McLaughlin, if I could um, ask, ask you first. Um, your evidence strongly argues the festival sector is not doing enough to mitigate its environmental impacts. Uh, what, what's preventing the industry from taking more meaningful action to address the problem up until now? Thank you. Um, yeah, well, the, the reason we think that not enough action is happening is that although, although there's been a pledge to reduce emissions by 50% um, by 2025, in the five years between making that pledge in 2015 and now, emissions from the sector have actually gone up. So, you know, why isn't there meaningful action? I mean, I think it's very similar to what we see across many sectors, that they, there's a need for a clear policy and regulatory framework that means that people in the sector know that they have to invest and plan for this and deliver on it. So, you know, a kind of year-on-year -year reduction, a monitoring of that, an adjustment if the pathway that's been planned isn't, isn't being followed. So I think it's about... It's about structure, it's about monitoring, and it's about ongoing challenge to the way that, that things are done. That's not to say that there isn't a lot of enthusiasm um, and a lot of commitment to this, but the data speaks for itself that the emissions have gone up in the last five years. I, I wonder, I mean, and perhaps, um, perhaps Robert, you could, you could have a go at this one. I, I wonder if there's something inherently unenvironmental uh, about music festivals that mean that despite the you know, very strong views of many of the people who attend them and play at them, etc., on, on, the, on the need to, to do something in relation to climate change and the environment and so on, that actually music festivals as we know them are just um, you know, some of the worst polluters, you, you know, polluting type of activities you could come across. Well, that's, you know, that's a big question. I mean, as a, I can only speak from the point of view of an artist who's enjoyed, you know, living in a fossil fuel economy for the last 30 years in the North, Northern Hemisphere. Um, and sort of, I guess, express some of my frustrations within my own industry, because when we set out to make this report with Tyndall, we didn't actually, um, you know, set out to make a report on the festival industry. We wanted to understand our own emissions as a band, because we're very aware of the carbon activity and the carbon negative production, you know, that you know that we produce when we're touring. So, we went to see Tyndall on a recommendation because we'd spent years offsetting our own behaviour by planting trees and a morass of different schemes, and we felt that it was time to do something a little bit, a little bit more sort of fundamental. Um, I think it's been frustrating as well to sort of like experience the lack of meaningful activity within our sector, and I guess as an activist, I've also felt pretty livid about it. The industry seems to have been locked in a cycle of, I guess, green pledges, carbon calculations, while emission rates have remained really high. Um, paradoxically, you know, as an artist, even though we drive ticket, you know, sales, if you will, we've had very little control over the organisation of events and festivals and, and, even, and even the way venues organise themselves over power and how audiences are expected to travel to and from venues and festival sites. <clears throat> and it's become something, I guess, of an embarrassment that the artist wears the climate T-shirt, waves the placard and makes declarations from the stage while simultaneously operating in a high carbon, high polluting sector. And that's just not really something we feel comfortable about. You know, we've become the messengers. But I guess after 30 years of climate science, the Paris Accord, the IPCC 1.5 report, 
countless Attenborough documentaries, Greta Thunberg, Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion, we kind of feel the public's got the message and now's the time for action, no more pledges, you know. So okay. we're very aware of the, the toxicity of our industry, but we also feel that cleaning it up in a sustainable economic level uh, is not mutually exclusive. Okay. Thank you. Prof- Professor McLaughlin, if the, the live music sector... I, I, I know you're preparing a report around this, which isn't, isn't out yet, so I don't expect you to tell us all of its findings, although feel free to do so if you, if you want to. But um, if the live music sector really was to take this issue seriously, what are the things that you... the sorts of things that you think it would do? So I think that the primary thing is it's, it's a mindset change, and this is, this is true across all sectors really that it's about thinking about every single thing that you do how could that be done more sustainably and the sort of sense that well we've always done it like this or it's very difficult is not is not an okay answer you know there has to be a pathway to getting to really low emissions um, and then if, if there's some emissions you cannot get rid of there's no technical solution for that then looking at the kind of negative emissions and offset things but really focusing on every single action and and the reason I you know maybe seems a bit flippant to say it's about thinking about everything but it it has to be core to what you're trying to achieve because if you allow a comparison with a kind of business as usual we won't meet our carbon targets it's always going to be quite difficult for the, the the transformation option to win through Whereas what you need to be picking between are different options for transformation. Mm. So we are going to get to zero carbon. How are we going to do it has to be the question mm. rather than what could we do that's a you know, bit of a tweak to how we do things already in order to knock the emissions down a little bit. So it's, it's having that kind of vision towards um, you know, really genuinely sustainable live music and festivals. See, uh, I suppose, I, I mean, when Jarvis Cocker said, is this the way the future is really supposed to feel or just 20,000 people standing in a field? I mean, if you've got 20,000 people standing in a field or 100,000 people standing in a field, it's, it's not just that. You've got to get them there, haven't you, to that field. And you've got to get them there from... And, and the, the, the way they get there is, 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 is by car isn't it, largely, and so on. How do you, how on earth do you overcome that issue? Um, okay, so I, I, I never get talk- to zero carbon, just to, just to challenge you on that point. I, I do want to talk about audience travel, but let's talk first of all about the things very directly in the control of the people putting on events. So that's about how much energy they consume and the pattern of that energy, you know, shaving the peak of the energy. And where do they get it from? And it, you know, in our submission, we talked about because the decarbonisation of the grid has been such a success story in the UK, if you can connect to the grid, um, that, is, that is a really good way of decarbonising. If you're going to do it in some other way, um, then you need to be trying to track the level of carbon intensity per kilowatt hour that we'll be getting out of the grid. So really grid, grid connection is really important or, or a solution that's as ambitious um, that isn't grid connected. And again, that's about, that could be about long-term planning. Um, you know the demand and the layout of the of the sites, so that you're so that you're making the most of where you are grid connected, where you're shaving the peaks, so that the demand off the grid isn't as high at those at those peak moments. Mm. Um, and then there's also issues around the travel of crew and artists. And I think this is a bit of a blind spot in the sector. I think um, you know the reports around festival decarbonisation say that. And so you have to look at that as well. You know how many people are travelling? How are they travelling? No and more Shirley ownership. Bassey arriving at Glastonbury in a helicopter, that sort of thing. You've got to take ownership of those emissions because that's what gives you credibility, in my view, to then work with the audience to reduce their emissions. And what I would say about travel is you've got to make it the funnest, easiest way to get there is the low carbon option. So there's some incentive side of it. And you make it difficult for all but people who have particular access requirements. You make it difficult for them to come in the other modes. Okay. There will, of course, be decarbonisation of private of private vehicles over time as we shift to um, electric vehicles. But that's not going to come fast enough for the kind of transformation that we're talking about here. So it is about shifting people onto public transport. So how can organisers take a more active role in working with local authorities, with transport providers, to, to create those those transport options for people that are okay. that are really high value that are um, that are incredibly convenient and reliable and actually I think you know in the sort of festival sector one of the things that, that I think is an interesting thing to explore is how you kind of make it fun as well okay. you know how do you make that how do you make that part of the experience in a, in a positive way okay 
Thanks, Robert. Could I? Uh, a number of different bands have, have taken um, different approaches. Coldplay said they won't tour unless it's carbon neutral. Um, how useful is that kind of approach? And what role do you think artists have to play in, in decarbonisation of live events? There's, there's two ways of looking. I mean, one, to be honest, one band's unilateral action is not going to change the, the, the sort of the look of the whole pr problem here at all. So, you know, one band not touring doesn't change a thing. I mean, we've recently toured America by train, which was actually an interesting experience. We managed to reduce our carbon over that tour by something like 45, 50% just in, in, in the band transportation alone and making other, you know, taking other measures within the sort of rider section of, the, of that kind of organization of our tour. But I, th I think ultimately, you know, we're talking about a sector which has been really hit hard. You know what I mean? We, you know, we are, you could arguably say a product of the festival sort of like a culture sector. And we need to sort of look at these things as year on year on small, they're very small kind of adjustments. You know, we're not talking about having to cancel anything. We have bands, bands don't need to cancel tours and, and the festivals don't need to cancel festivals. We, there's, there's a way of, you know, creating a sort of like a, a less, you know, pretty much you're bringing emissions down year on year by 7.6%, which is well within the recommendations by the UN without facing prohibition and cancellations. And that goes for the bands and the organizers of the festivals. There's lots of different solutions across transportation where you can charter trains and buses and even get tents and, and luggage there to a festival, you know, in the right way. Um, and in the same way, bands can take the train themselves. There's lots of different solutions for energy and powering a festival. Okay. Some of the formulas we're looking for our Liverpool project, which we can talk about later, we can go into some of the, the various solutions yeah, I, around I think power. people are going to ask you about that later on, Robert, about the, yeah. the Liverpool show. So I, won't, I don't want to, to stray onto other people's territory. Just, just um, before I, I, I finish up, just to ask you um, briefly about something else while we've, we've got you, he, you here. Um, th there's an article in Today's Guardian about a, t a potential 10-point plan to try and resolve the issue of touring in Europe and musicians playing in Europe post-Brexit. Uh, uh, would you have anything to say or any comment or, or, or ideas about what's happened post-Brexit in relation to the ability of bands and others to continue um, you know, touring in European Union countries? It's, it's like, um, I wasn't really planning to answer that, but I mean, uh, I guess there's a lot of conversation. I mean, you know, you guys have already... I guess I'm interviewed about that and you've also interviewed about the problems artists face with their revenues from the digital streaming platform since the safe harbor deals were made with labels because there's been effectively a paradigm shift in the way artists actually can make income for the industry whereas we used to tour to promote a record it's the complete opposite now you know we yeah. music comes out well and it promotes the tour effectively and so you've seen an exponential rise in bands touring and festival products and and the, the festival industrial complex has grown and grown exponentially over the last sort of 10 years, which means there's a lot more, there's a lot of moving parts now, a lot of more, a lot more crews moving, more gear moving, more bands and artists moving. So, it, you know, Brexit's made it very difficult. And I think some of the conversations we're having around movement, I mean, I won't get into the visa area because it's well out of my, my, my depth, really. I, I can't, I have no power to sort of change that. And the, uh, most artists have made their feelings very well known there. Um, but I do think there's a different way in which we can approach carrying all that gear around with us in tour buses, you know, passing like okay. ships in the night while we don't maybe hire the gear directly from the venues and the venues hire from the suppliers. Mm. So we're using a lot of the same gear in the supply chain mm. because let's face it, a lot of it is the same equipment. It's, it's definitely a way we can reduce mm. the amount of carny and the amount of gear that's been travelled by haulage across Europe. Mm. Well, uh, that might be happening anyway with the, what we hear from the the who are mainly based in the UK about what's happening to their businesses as a result of it. But I won't, uh, I won't press the point further since that isn't the main focus of today's uh, inquiry. Back to you, Chair. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Professor McLaughlin, uh, you mentioned right at the start of your uh, answer, your first answer, that, that emissions from festivals had gone up in the past five years. Is this due to what Robert's described as the festival industrial complex? What are the reasons for that... Uh, that, that increase in the past five years? Well, I'm citing the Show Must Go On report there for that figure, and their explanation is that an increase in audience numbers. So yes, it is what, what Rob mentions, that although the, there is a relative improvement in measures like carbon per audience member per day, 
you know, from a climate change perspective, relative measures are just not where it's at. It's about absolute carbon emissions. Um, and so, you know, what I would like to see is the sector make a commitment in absolute terms to reduce its carbon emissions. Yeah. And you said that the relative numbers had, had, had gone down. Um, how much have they gone down by? So according to that report, around 23%, but that's only looking at uh, energy, waste and water on the site, because as I mentioned right. before, you know, there, there's, there's less certainty around the audience travel, but also band and crew travel. So it's not the full picture that you're looking at there. Um, and there is a need to understand that, that more. But we can safely say that there's more carbon there that's not being uh, captured in, in that kind of complete mm. way, although there might be particular events that, that capture it. Do we still have those uh, disposable tents? I mean, I can remember the pictures from a few years ago of uh, after a festival, all the, 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 basically the fields of uh, disposable tents. Uh, it, it seemed like, uh, well, it seemed like an, an absolute abhorrent waste. So I, I can only say anything about that as a, as a festival goer, that I know that at uh, the last time Glastonbury uh, was happening, there was a lot of work to try and, to try and stop people abandoning tents, you know, and to, to take a more circular economy type approach to taking your tent home and bringing it back the next time but I don't have any particular figures on the waste from tents. Yeah because there was a lot of talk about donating to homeless etc etc it was one of those things where in which you wonder whether or not there's a breakdown between the uh, the promise and actual delivery if you see what I mean so I, I, I do wonder whether or not there's been any sort of real progress in, in that place in terms of uh, tents uh, not just in terms of Glastonbury but more generally for other festivals as well. I think these elements can be very symbolically important as well. You know, if it's a sort of coalition of the audience, the organisers, the artists all coming together to deliver change, um, if you can have a very convincing narrative on that as, a, as an event and bring your audience with you, that feels like a, you know, a positive way to go. But I do think there is this credibility um, that you have to maintain by genuinely reducing the emissions directly under the control of the event mm. um, before, you know, kind of enthusiastically encouraging mm. audience members to do, you know, anything in particular to reduce their carbon footprint. Yeah, so no, no, it, it, no gestures, effectively. It's about actual action rather than gestures in that respect. Yeah, I mean, we've taken far too long to decarbonise in general, every mm. sector, and there is, there is no time for gestures. There is time for immediate, urgent, significant emissions reductions. Thank you. Steve Bryan. Thanks very much, Chair. Good morning, Robert. Good morning, Carly. Um, we're talking about greening of our festival sector. We're talking about all these efforts this morning as part of a wider inquiry into festivals. And the reason why we wanted to do this inquiry is because you know, we believe festivals are an important industry in this country and um, there's, there's a lot of employment around them and they're part of, you know, remember that word, fun. But all this discussion about greening of festivals, as you rightly said, has been going on for a long time. Given, bluntly, a lot of festivals right now are deciding whether they can survive, isn't this a bit first world? Is that um, well? I mean, to be honest, if you know this, these questions about the uh, the industry making progress in its sort of transition to a, a more a carbon, a better carbon position, would have been a bit more difficult uh, a few weeks ago. But since we submitted the evidence, I've got some notes here that the the live the industry has convened a new umbrella group called Live, which is sustainability, which has sustainability as a key focus, which we're really you know excited about, obviously. And we understand the group is planning a sector-wide charter to remove, reduce emissions resulting from live music events. And they're also talking to Tyndall and contributing to the Tyndall roadmap. Mm. And we hope that the decarbonisation roadmap that Tyndall scientists and analysts are producing will underpin the live charter. So this is coming from the industry itself. So yeah. recognise it's got this problem, but it doesn't feel that the problem is exclusive to, you know, it doesn't, it, it's not mutually exclusive. I mean, you can you reassemble the industry post-pandemic and, and still, you know, rebuild that economy and still reduce emissions in a meaningful way incrementally, as opposed to in, in, in a, taking drastic measures. And obviously, you know, the idea of drastic measures will bring the industry to a halt, which we don't want in the future. It's, you know, as you pointed out, it's, a, it's, a, it's not just a, a cultural situation, it's a way of life. It's a community, thousands of highly skilled professionals work in that sector and they've, had, they've been through a terrible time. And this project is, all about avoiding prohibition. There's not a bone of prohibition in it. It's about the opposite. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, while you've got the floor, then, Robert, you know, you, you've talked before about um, you know offsetting creates an illusion that high carbon activities can continue, and you know the Tyndall Centre have talked about reducing primary emissions rather than secondary emissions. Do you want to just give us a sense of what you mean by by that? What is you basically mean getting down to brass tacks? What what, do you, what, what does that look like in practical terms? Well, I mean, when I, yeah, we talk about there's no sign of greenhouse gas emissions peaking in the next few years, according to the UN. So the longer we delay action, the more drastic the action required. And that's going to, as, as I've probably said already, have an even more devastating effect on future jobs and livelihoods in the music industry, the, the live music industry, and particularly the festival industry. But I mean, in terms of taking immediate actions, I'll probably pass the, the mic over to Carly. Yeah, OK. Well, please do, Carly. I'll come back to you, Robert, um, okay. in a bit. Carly. So yeah, particularly around offsetting, what I would encourage every sector, but the you know the festival sector, the live music sector to do is have a pathway for reducing their emissions. It's quite a it's quite a recent development that everybody is so obsessed with net zero. You know, we were we used to be talking about eighty percent reduction by twenty fifty. Now we talk about net zero as if we've kind of always talked about it, but it's actually quite recent. And what that has done, that target, is it's mashed together emissions reduction with offsetting or negative emissions. And so actually the point at which you stop getting your emissions down and buy some offsets or some negative emissions in a net zero framing could kind of be anywhere between just offsetting everything now or getting right down to zero on your emissions. And I think what's really important is that you have a, you have a pathway for both and you're constantly challenging. What, what do we feel we just cannot get down at the moment so we might consider offsetting or negative emissions? And how do we come back to that and challenge and say, has the technology moved on? Could we, could we look at investing in a different way? Could we look at different partnerships in order to bring those emissions down? And you know, my personal view is that people should be very cautious about calling themselves carbon neutral because it does create a sense that there are no impacts from, what we, from you know, the thing that we've been doing. And I think that means that you then lose a bit of a sense of the urgency to challenge and keep chipping away at those emissions and getting them down. So if the industry wants to have some offsetting, some negative emissions, there are lots of questions to ask in the types of projects that you go, that you go for there. But the primary message for me is to, to get the actual emissions down, because once you've, made, once you've emitted it, it is definitely contributing to climate change. There's always an element of uncertainty and risk about the negative side of it, either because you know, the projects can be reversed, undone, that you know, you're, you're relying on a, things to happen over a number of years, but you've definitely emitted it already. So it's much better to not emit it in the first place and not have to rely on that chain. OK, but, but I'm still looking for practical, you know, in your, your recommendations about reducing primary admissions. You know, I, I'm a big festival goer and, and a lover. What, what would I notice different? What do I lose? What do I gain? What's going to change to yeah, reduce so primary emissions, Carly? So, I mean, I think it, you know, a grid connection makes a huge difference. It's about how you're powering the festival. But the step before that is about potentially reorganizing your site in a, in a different way for the, for the power consumption. So, you know, as a festival goer, you know, the conversations we are having with people in the sector, there's so much creativity and enthusiasm to tackle this problem. I feel confident that that can be unleashed at this, at this problem. So you as a, go as a festival goer, I think you will have a very similar experience. You will have been encouraged onto public transport, which you will have found fantastic and convenient and reliable and the best way to, to access it. But will you still get to see great acts and great music? Yes, I think you will. So I don't think it's about putting it onto the audience. I think it's about the organizers thinking about, you know, who's playing at the show, how are they getting there and how are they powering the show? And all okay. of done while still delivering a good quality festival experience. All right, all right, that's that's good. Now, obviously, a big part of the festival experience is food and drink and supply chains. You, know, you talk about localised food, drink and, and supply chains. Now, you know, I have a festival here in my constituency. I go to Glastonbury, I go to other festivals. I see the same concessions at all of them. It's why they're struggling so much as a result of no festivals last year is that it is their business um that they don't look like locally sourced supply chains to me am i right does the evidence back that up so my area of expertise is not on uh, not on the concession side it's more about energy so i don't know if rob wants to say anything about that kind of local local side of things i think you know taking a kind of 
co-benefits approach to everything that, that you do to decarbonize you know so you have a just transition to a low carbon economy thinking about how you can support local prosperity and jobs seems like a really sensible thing to do and would certainly fit with the ethos of many festivals that kind of you know talk a lot about lo you know local benefits tackling climate change all these things would fit with a localized supply chain but that's not what we've been looking at in in our project with massive attack have you done any have you done any looking at the the customer's view of this so the public the festival goers view i i haven't directly looked at that in our work um but there are some there are some figures around how in how much support there is from from um festival goers and that they do expect the environmental impact yeah to be but, but they would but you, you know with, with, i wonder what your view is on this right so they they wouldn't say they didn't would they but you know i remember standing oh, at, I remember standing at Glastonbury a number of years ago um, and, and Bob Geldof was on stage and everybody was chanting make poverty history before then going off and paying £3.50 for a pint of Carlsberg. Um, so so, so my, my point is, is that, you know, when you, it's very easy to virtue signal in a field for a weekend and to say that all energy should be generated through renewable sources. But then on Monday morning, you want the hairdryer to work. And, and the point the point is, is that when people go to a festival, are they looking for certainly when they go back to festivals after the nightmare of the last 12 months, are they looking for release? Are they looking for hedonism or are they looking to then still be um, thinking responsibly about the planet? I mean, this is a very, this is a very I, I'm being devil's advocate deliberately, Carly. But, but, you know, you take my point is that do do the customers care enough? I just don't see it as contradictory in the way that you frame it. Um, I don't. I don't think there's a problem with both wanting to make poverty history and buying a pint of Carlsberg for three pounds fifty. In fact, at a festival, that's probably quite a good deal. Three pounds uh -huh. fifty. Depends um, how watered down it is. But yeah. <laughs> um, so, so I, I think I think people can hold both of those positions, but you know, very consistently. Um, but what what we are talking about is actually. Yes, there is demand coming from audience, um, from, from you know, ticket buyers and audience members. You, you, can, you, know, you can see that there's various sources saying that. But I also think that we have to create a situation where the industry, where there is a lot of enthusiasm to do this, know that they're going to have to do it. So in order to be able to get a license, in order to be able to get sponsorship, in order for people to want to buy their tickets, they're going to have to do it. And that gives them then the stability to know that investment will be worthwhile because it isn't an option to not. Whereas yeah. if, if we just compare it to business as usual, then yeah, of, of course that's, that's a challenge, but this should be in a frame of that we're trying to decarbonize. Yeah, well, it's interesting you, you mentioned a license, you know, what, what are, you know, the safety advisory groups, the SAG, you know, maybe that should be the SSAG, the safety and sustainability advisory groups, and that should be a key part of what they're doing. I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I just wonder, you know, would that be a, a sensible suggestion? No, I mean, that's one of the things we would like to say to you today. So, yes, we do think that licensing is, is, a, is a key tool to use. Um, if you look at how many local authorities have declared a climate emergency, the net zero plans at a national level, then yeah. it would be very sensible that if you're allowing an event in your, in your area, that you ask not just have you, have you considered your environmental impacts, um, particularly your carbon emissions, but what is your plan for reducing those? And it's that year on year asking and monitoring of what's better this year. How are we getting on that pathway to zero? So not a sense of, well, we thought about it, but all we can all we can make work is diesel generators, but actually like trying to get a pathway away from diesel generators. So that requires kind of ongoing challenge and checking, I think. OK, thank you. And then just finally back to you, Rob, I, I just want to ask you something about, about um, touring bands, but just on the public, on the idea of the public and the customers and the, the ticket buying festival goers you know ultimately you know they're the ones who should drive this are they going to refuse to buy tickets to festivals that they don't believe are are sustainable events well that's a, i mean that's a good question I, I mean speaking listening to what you guys have been talking about just then I, I mean i do think that the audience do have a participatory component here i think they do have an opinion and and they do want to sort of see the festivals modify and correct their behavior because i don't see it in the case of people just turn up and just do whatever goes at the festival that weekend and then leave and pack up and get back on with their lives. I think this is a part of something we all feel that we're moving together with. As a band, working with promoters, we've often challenged the food and drink supply and where the supply chain is. And we've yeah. a lot. I mean, we've, 
over summer, for instance, we will encounter lots of different festivals, some very big festivals and some small, smaller local festivals. You see a big difference between the small community based festival, which has local supply chains embedded within yeah. it. And that's what the festival's about. And obviously the bigger festivals, they struggle a bit more because of the scale of, of the project. But I do feel that everyone wants to change together. And I do feel the audience wants to see that change. And when we've actually been at the front end of putting festivals on, we've gone for meat free festivals. And you know, you might get a few people complaining that they couldn't get a burger, but on the whole, you're gonna get that. Not everyone's always gonna be happy, but you can make those changes and people will go with you. Two hours once. Yeah. And then just just finally, Rob, with you, um, you yeah, I, I, I didn't get the impression that you were that enamoured with Coldplay's announcements about their no touring announcement at the end of uh, 2019, which looked prophetic given what happened. Um, what do you think about that? Is this a bit of a gimmick, dare I say, or is there something to that? I mean, look, I understand their frustration, you know, and it's a frustration all bands have been feeling for a long time and everyone gets asked, how can you, how can you square touring with climate change? And we, all of us end up looking like hypocrites. You know, we always have that, hence the idea the point I made earlier about us be sort of being reduced to being messengers where we just message about climate change and where wave the placards, but still could, you know, contribute to the problem. And that's not somewhere we want to be. And we, as we have very little control over the way festivals and live events are organized, you can tell that that frustration is going to keep coming. And often a band will say something unilaterally you know, like, well, we're going to stop touring. And it might seem the sensible thing to do in one instance, but the whole problem is it's all about collective solutions and systemic change. It means everyone's got to work together across all of it, the festival promoters, the audience and the bands. And there's a way, I think, like we keep saying, without looking towards drastic measures and prohibition that year on year reductions in line with the UN sort of like uh, targets, we can make this thing work easily. But, do, but do, do you look like hypocrites or, you know, at the end of the day, you know, what are we what are we what are we seeking to save ourselves for? I mean, you, know, you bring a lot of pleasure, and a lot of fun, and a lot of enjoyment. I mean, you know, like if we're going to save that, if we're going to save ourselves, surely we've got to have something to look forward to. We? You know, seeing massive attack is a good gig, right? It depends on your perspective, but I mean, well, mine you know, is that it is. Thanks for the compliment. I mean, I mean, ultimately, what That's I mean by that is the fact that if we are continually rolled out to sort of be the, you know, to to make the pledges with no control over whether those pledges turn into action, it becomes problematic for us. We, it starts to, it starts to, it creates a sort of like a, almost a space. If you look at the distance between pledging and action in that shadow is greenwashing in a way. We don't want to be greenwashing for our own industry. That's the last place we want to be as artists. We want to stand up. And if we're going to make declarations, we're going to want to stand by them and know that they actually will be followed, meaningful action will follow them. And yeah. we don't have the ability to sort of have any, we've had no control over that in our own industry. Which has been a source of frustration. Hence, you get Coldplay, Coldplay making that declaration about stopping touring. But I guess everyone knows that's not the solution. One band stopping touring, or even all bands stopping touring. Because as you pointed out, culture is important. It brings everybody together. And so I think the best way is to look for solutions together. You know, collectively. But the extreme, you know, the extreme end of you all not touring would be that basically you just use technology, and that, uh, technology produces avatars that appear on stage, and you and you play the and you play the and you play the the gig um, that way, and, uh, and you know that that way, then I could have massive attack from the early '90s, or you know I could have a young Brett Michaels and Poison appear on the stage, and then imagine the excitement for me at that rock. Um, if you have a younger version of me, would be I think you know is that, exactly. You know, so why don't we just create avatars of you and just be done with it? And you can, you can sit in your artistic studio, which looks fantastic, and um, and, and you wouldn't have to travel anywhere. Well, that'd be great, but all the money would go back to the network providers and the, and the DSPs, wouldn't it? And we'd have oh, well, a big uh, about it. Inquiry. And then just, just finally, your, your low carbon <laughs> event in Liverpool, um, yeah. the city I used to live in and, and I lo love, love much, what is that about? Well, it's, I mean, basically it's an experiment and it's what we call an open and transparent, open source collaborative experiment. So everything we do there, all the, pre, all the, the six primary emission principles are gonna be shared, something we'll share with everybody. Um, so the six key emissions are this, the first ever smart to train ticket system via three train providers. The second is 100% renewable energy event power achieved via renewable to battery technology, green hydrogen power units. Third is zero to landfill waste management. Four is a meat free arena. Five is advanced liaison with tour production to reduce haulage and locally source as much tech as possible. And six is free post show EV shuttles to major train stations. And these Excellent. Are, and what, what is the venue? Where, where, whereabouts in Liverpool is uh, it? Well, hopefully this is out, out there on, on the dock side. Um, on the dock side. With a date yet to be uh, sort of settled upon, considering the dynamic situation. Of course. Everybody's in, yeah.
All right, follow the roadmap, as they say. Follow the hashtag, follow the data. OK, thank you very much, Robert. Back to you, Chair. Yes. Uh, thank you, Steve. I now have an image of you in your perfect festival, which involves poison and £3.50 Carlsberg lager. Uh, I, don't think you get, I don't think you can get a pint of £3.50 at most festivals, though. Um, Robert. This was a few years ago. So. Yeah. <laughs> Robert, will you pay? Well, do you think people will pay more in order to have a festival which is much more uh, friendly to the planet, um, given as well that obviously the industry is in very straightened circumstances right now with not having been able to have a, a summer of uh, 2020, uh, and the possibility that... Are you fearful that the possibility is that people will try and cut corners and try and just basically put up a, a festival or a show for as little as possible? I think, I think when we look at sort of the biggest promoters have a lot of liquidity and there's no argument that the biggest promoters and the biggest bands can probably absorb some of the costs of transition, you know, and some of these technologies we're looking at, the green hydrogen uh, battery cell units, for instance, obviously there's a bit of a lag in supply and demand, but we can see that moving into, into sort of use very quickly. Um, around audience transportation, you know, again, band transportation by a train, audience transportation by transport hubs, I can imagine maybe that there will need to be some price differentiation to absorb some of these costs, but I don't think an audience would, would look badly upon that. I think, I think if I'm a band, we'll probably take a hit on, our, on our, our offers in order to get back out on the road again, in order to sort of like, you know, absorb some of those costs. And I would imagine the promoters and the audience and the bands will all be happy to absorb a few of those costs. But again, these are transitional year on year on reductions in carbon emissions and, and costs that are being incurred to do that. It's not, like a, it's not something we're going to ever imagine a, as a drastic step unless we don't do anything, unless we continue to be inactive. OK. But obviously there will be extra costs from this, but also there will be extra costs from COVID as well, because it's yeah. likely that people are going to have to pay for tests, et cetera, et cetera, before they can uh, to attend these events, which I think, I mean, the sort of prices we're talking about probably between five and maybe £15 pounds per, per uh, festival goer. So I, I wonder whether or not you think that this, this needs to, to take account of the fact that people will be asked to pay more anyway over the next year or so, and whether or not it therefore needs to be a much more gradualist approach. I think, I think all it has, to be, it has to be balanced economically, and it will be a gradual approach. But, you know, we're talking over initially a five-year period of, you know, you know, meaningful emission reduction. And, and I think those costs can be absorbed. And I'll take your point on... The testing and the COVID, the COVID, the COVID dynamic here, how it's going to affect the price of tickets, and you know we have, you know I'm not qualified to sort of speak on that really. I mean maybe Carly can talk about it or, or maybe somebody else, but I do believe that this is very achievable. Great, thank you, Heather Wheeler. Thank you, Chair. Um, Carly, my question was really meant to be about um, through the COVID oh, period, um, have we lost sight of uh, what environmental impacts have been with live performances. But of course, we haven't had any live performances. So um, I'm trying to work out whether um, you think that this, this downtime that there's been, um, has the music industry, the festival industry, really taken a look at what they could do when they, so build back better? Um, I mean, I'm blessed by having Cat and Hall and the Spring Gathering Festival group, so Bloodstock uh, in my patch. And, uh, you know, um, are you helping to work with these big groups to see if they can build back better? So as a research team, you know, we're, we're, we're newbies to music. So, you know, we, we, we know about carbon and energy um, and we're learning about music with the, with the sector. And I think that's really important to try and co-produce recommendations. So we don't come in and say, this is what you need to do. We come in and try to, to help and collaborate. Um, and I, I think what, we, what we, we've seen that's been really encouraging is that in the conversations we've been having with people um, in the sector, it has seemed for many to provide a moment of reflection. You know, there's obviously been incredible hardship in the sector, but as people look to, to, you know, to have a pathway to live events again, actually issues around sustainability, diversity and mental health have all been raised to us as a sort of moment to think about how that's all supported. So absolutely, thinking about building back better and you know the, the question earlier around you know is it is it really kind of a bit first world to think about uh, to think about this at a time where the sector is trying to survive i actually think we need to take just a, a longer view for the benefit of the sector that so that it has a more sustainable future 
that can be in line with net zero so that we don't get to a point down the line where reductions are you know, incredibly costly because they really need to be done very, very quickly and, and, and very severely. So I think it, it absolutely can be part of, of Build Back Better um, and, and it should be. And that's the kind of thing where when you reassemble what you're doing, new things are possible because we're having to challenge things around COVID anyway. So that reassembly could be for both um, the kind of COVID reassembly, which is, is hopefully a, a fairly short term measure for the, for the sector, but then building out from that into a more sustainable version of festivals. Thank you, Robert. Um, taking that on to the next step, uh, step the support that there has been for um, festival groups, uh, live events groups, you know, whether it's been enough is, is, is a bigger question. But um, do you know if there's been any practical support from those grants where um, when the business does come back, that, that they will be able to put those sustainable improvements? Or, or actually, is this just an absolute roadblock? And, and, and because we're worried about everything else, um, we've lost sight of that bit, please. I mean, I'm not absolutely qualified to answer that question entirely, but I do know that when speaking about our own people and our, our own crew with various different sort of, uh, you know, I guess, I guess, you know, very different situations. A lot of people have fallen through the gaps in terms of benefits and, and support. Um, and in fact, our, our tour manager, David Lawrence, was instrumental in setting up the Stagehand organisation, which has helped crews for the last sort of 18 months or 12 months to 18 months and dealing with, you know, with not only sort of people's, uh, you know, livelihoods, but also, as Carly pointed out, mental health as well. Um, I'd like to think that building back better, as you call it, and reassembling the industry so it can reopen um, won't impact upon those livelihoods. So I'd like to think that actually we can enhance those livelihoods by creating a, a sense of sustainability. And I don't think the crews will have to absorb these costs. I do think that the promoters and the bands to a certain extent, and I won't be popular for saying that, maybe we'll be able to resolve those costs more than the crew will have to. So between the two of you, I'm not sure who might be able to answer this, but I mean, the, the, the industry-led sustainability, that those initiatives, I mean, have they been successful? Or is it so, um, to use a bad phrase, so last year that, that we can't really remember about it? You know, is, is there anything new on the horizon that when we manage to open up these festivals again and, and Catton Hall is absolutely rocking, you know, what, what, um, what, what might they see this time that's different, please? Want me to do that, Rob? Yeah. <laughs> so I think, as, as Rob mentioned earlier, this new, this new body live coming in to say that they want to make a charter. Now, you know, that's great. We've had conversations with them and it does feel like, you know, a, a clear sense of commitment to doing this from the industry. My only caution to that, of course, is that we have five years ago had a, a pledge that, that didn't come directly out of that kind of industry trade body, if you like, but, but did have a lot of backing in the sector. So I think what we need to see behind that is, you know, like pledge and move super fast. So, you know, you make that pledge, but what is, what's happening immediately to make those reductions? And I think, you know, one of the things we would like to see um, is, is independent review of, of progress against that. And whether that's something that, you know, you as a committee could call people back um, in, a, in a year's time to see what progress has been made and what plans there are, or whether that's something for the department to provide that independent review. Um, but I think that that really helps a, a sense of like, your progress will be reviewed and commented upon. That will also give the industry an opportunity to say what it needs in order to make that progress move faster. But I think if you don't hold if you don't hold people to account on the pledges that they make, pledge campaigns often don't lead to a reduction in emissions. Yeah, I mean to finish, Robert, um, it's really interesting. You know the way certain festivals and and part of the industry um, make arrangements with green charities, and and they make great claims. And uh, you know you you use that great phrase greenwashing. You know how successful really has it been? Um, I mean, is this the moment for absolute change? Yeah, I do. I do believe. You know, we, like I said, we've we've done, you know, thirty years of messaging as, along with most of the, our peers in the industry, and there's been multiple pledges made over the last sort of decade. Um, and as we've seen, the emissions the emissions curve has gone up, so it's actually not worked at all. So we know that. So now is the time to turn pledges into action. You know, definitely. And, and working with Carly and Tyndall, you start to realise how that might manifest. That's really helpful. Chair, back to you. Thank you so much. Thank Cheers. you, Heather.
John Nicholson. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Chair. I have to see, say I feel very guilty really asking some of these questions given how much we know festivals are struggling. So it almost, there's a sort of touch of the Marie Antoinette really about some of, some of this given that they're having an existential crisis, uh, many of them. But nonetheless, we are where we are. And I'm, I'm just reading some of the figures and they are really extraordinary, aren't they? And I, I'd like to ask uh, Professor McLaughlin about this. 25,000 tonnes of waste, 876 tonnes of CO2 and 185 million litres of water annually. This is just for UK festivals when they're up and running. That's twice as much produced um, over what the average daily consumption is for households. I haven't yet managed to get a handle on why it's so bad, why these figures are so bad from the evidence thus far. So I, I think the, the issue, the challenge for festivals is that so many of them operate um, outside our existing infrastructures for energy, mm. waste and water. And so then that makes it very, very challenging. And I mean, you know, I think if you look at the kind of waste performance in the sector, you know, many audience members might be a bit surprised by how much of the savings in the in the recent years have been from avoiding waste going to landfill, which, you know, in your own home recycling has has been a, you know, a key priority for many years. But actually, when you're sort of collecting things from a site and you don't have that infrastructure, um, then there's sort of more work to do there. So I think that's that's part of the that's part of the problem. And that's why we would recommend that people um, that, that festivals, if they can get a grid connection, um, but I mean, on things like waste, for example, I think, you know, as is often the case with climate change, we're framing this very much as everything that you'll do here will cost more money. So how are we going to afford that? But there's some things that you can do that will actually save you money. And if you don't create waste in the first place, you do not have the costs of collecting it. So that's actually a way to save money in your industry if you reduce the volume of waste. The same if you can reduce your energy consumption, you know, so if you can if you can arrange things differently, if you can kind of program things differently, lay it out differently in order to reduce um, consumption, that, that's a saving. So I don't think we should always present every, of course, there will have to be investment to get towards uh, net zero, I absolutely accept that. But when you save energy and when you save collection costs, you are saving money. I mean, obviously, I understand that uh, festivals don't have um plumbed in clutches like uh, like we have it uh, at home. <laughs> so I understand why that type of waste might be a bit of a problem, but I don't understand why you can't recycle plastic bottles, for example, from festivals. Well, I think that is increasingly happening. And I mean, actually, the, the best option is to not have the plastic bottles mm, in the first place. Yeah, exactly. So go to systems where you've got like water flowing that you can fill a, re a refillable bottle um, where, where you can use cups that are that are more easily reprocessed rather than plastic bottles. So, you know that that should be possible, but it's about your waste collection contract um, and whether whether you can whether you can get that service. But I think my understanding is that that is an area that the sector is moving on um, in a, actually in a, in a more kind of effective way. In the the report, the relative emissions reduction that I mentioned earlier is mainly coming from improvements in waste management. In a way, it's surprising, isn't it, that the waste problems should be so bad at festivals, given the demographic, because all the evidence is that uh, young people who are disproportionately likely to go to festivals, obviously, apart from um, Steve Bryan, who, who defies that trend, but young people are more likely than any other group to, to go to festivals. And we know that they are disproportionately interested in environmental issues. So why do you think there's there's this gulf between what we assume uh, young people care about and what they're actually doing in practice at these festivals. I think this is a you know a, a common problem between the sort of structure and agency in the world. So yes, audience members may want to have a lower impact, but is the structure that they're operating within facilitating or allowing them to do that? If there is nowhere to recycle your plastic bottles and all water is sold in plastic bottles, then you're going to create over a weekend plastic bottle waste. 
Um, whereas if you're encouraged ahead of time to bring your refillable bottle and to refill that for free on site, then you're not going to. So I think there is only so much individuals can do with their agency, and that varies between people. Um, but we have to get the structures right to make that easy for people uh, to achieve you know, these, these goals that they want to. I also think we shouldn't be relying on the altruism of individuals. You know, we need to, this is a, this is a national priority to transform to, to net zero. So how do we create an environment where that is, that is the only option to make that transformation? And we don't, we don't require it of individual festival goers to manage their waste. Actually, it's, it's, the, it's the festival themselves. And I think they do lots to, to help to manage this already, um, to, to reduce the amount of waste created and then how it's processed. And, and the content, the makeup of that waste, which materials are being used. And um, I think there's a lot of knowledge in the sector about how to reduce those kind of waste emissions. I noticed earlier on, and I wrote down what you said, that there needs to be a coalition to deliver change. Um, we, we all realise that coalitions can cause enormous damage to the country, but this is a, a benevolent coalition, uh, presumably. Who would need to take the lead in that coalition? Who would need to take charge? Who'd, who'd be the lead player? Well, I'll let Rob come in on this after me if, if he wants to. But I mean, I think the obvious actor for me at the moment is, is this live group that have, that have been created recently since we submitted our evidence and made an, an environment group in order to look at this. And they're looking at a charter and a plan. But I think the coalition part comes from um, who's continually kind of keeping the challenge on that, on delivery, on year on year emissions reductions. But then you've also got lots of other players like the transport providers, um, the district network operators of the electricity system, you know, actually you need all of that coming together and that kind of cross stakeholder group. And there's, you know, I think there's a lot of will to do that. And um, so hopefully it would be, it would be a positive coalition that we would achieve. Uh, Robert, Rob, can I turn to you then and ask you about that question? Uh, who, who needs to take the lead in this, in this benign coalition, which will deliver change? Well, I mean, as you, you point out, the existential crisis faced by the festival industry, but if we were to reevaluate that and look at the point of view from one of the largest promoters, they have two billion in liquidity. So if you're asking for leadership, then that's where you go. So that group that has got that, that resource and that power over the whole industry, that's where you start. You don't, you, know, you don't really start with the artist. The artist can do the messaging, as we discussed before. But it's the, the crew you know, that we're, we're talking about here, the crew and all those skilled workers that that make this industry, that make this culture work, that, that have that power to, to implement this change. It is really the promoters that need to, to lead. And lead what's, hold, what's holding them back, do you think? Bottom line? Yes. Bottom line. Oh, it's, it, it's, <laughs> the bottom line is the bottom line. Okay, so it's, it's, just, it's just greed. I don't, I don't think it's greed. I think, I'm, you know, I'd be oversimplifying to say that I know how this, this works economically. It's very difficult. It's very complex. But, we, you know, we do know that, um, you know, everyone's trying to protect their margins at all times. Everyone does. The band is trying to make their tour work and the audience is trying to afford to go to a festival. The crew are trying to make a living. The promoters are trying to make it all work. It's, you know, it's very complicated. So I'd, I'd hate to oversimplify. It's simple for me to do that. But, you know, it really is about having to sort of like work away from that bottom line agenda and think, OK, we're going to have to invest in this. To do the, to implement the things we need to implement in time to sort of like keep up with the recommendations by the UN or the IPCC, we're going to have to invest in this. And I think if we do, if the leadership is shown, then like I said, the bands will definitely we'll all be expected to take a hit on our fees. I should imagine because we're it, it just just because of the recovery process for the industry. And I imagine audiences will be receptive to spending a bit more money to go to a festival which is showing its its credentials. And that I mean that's me projecting that but that's how I feel about it well I hope you're right though I think a lot of musicians are going to be listening to this and screaming and saying we can't even tour at the moment and yeah, in... I'm, talking, I'm mostly talking about the the bands like us it can afford to sort of yes. make adjustment I'm, oh you know we know that a lot of the bands entering into this market are you know are going to strike it's a struggle as we found it a struggle so we're not expecting those bands to take a hit we want to our agenda here is not to, to create any sort of prohibition, nothing. We're looking to avoid prohibition and, and trying to create a sustainable future where you don't take drastic action, which creates more problems and, and sort of affects more livelihoods and, and stops bands entering into an industry like we had the opportunity to do so 30 years ago. Yes, because I was going to say we, we've discovered recently 
uh, talking about the visa issue, for example, the post-Brexit uh, visa issue, that uh, banned when they start to tour again are going to have to pay 600 euros per person uh, for a night in, in Spain. It's utterly unsustainable. And 500 uh, for, for Italy. You were talking about touring the States by train. And of course, that's expensive. I, I've traveled the States by, by train myself. I know how expensive it is. A lot of bands are only going to be able to tour at all if they sort the visa issue, first of all. And secondly, if they're able to use cheaper transport. So um, you very graciously said that you're in a different position from lots of other bands. Transit. Can I finish just by asking you, uh, and I like to do this with witnesses, if, if you could get us to just include one important point when we write this report, what would you ask us to include? What's the head? What's the what's the takeaway headline for for you that you really want us to understand? To be honest, I'd rather pass on to Carly because she is the expert in this, and I'm and and that's why we commissioned Tyndall because we're just merely the artist. Okay, Kylie. Thanks. Um, so I mean, I, I've mentioned it already that I think I think that independent review will will help the sector if if the department or if if you as a committee were to, to work with the new body that's created with a charter and a plan and to make sure that you, know, you see that as scientifically and technically robust in line with net zero targets for the UK and that it is delivered year on year. And that actually, I think, creates a space to have the conversations of, well, we're really struggling with this element of decarbonisation or this element, all the, the issues that you've raised there. But then that creates that ongoing conversation. But it isn't a sense of, Oh great! Somebody's you know made a pledge, and we'll come back in five years and see if you've if you've made progress because we can't make no progress for another five years. There's not enough carbon budget for us to be able to do that. Okay, thank you both very much. Back to you, Chair. Yes, thank you, thanks. John. Damien Hines. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, can I ask about where festivals take place? So you've recommended that it, they should happen where there's uh, where there's grid capacity and where there's access to mass public transport, ideally mass electrified uh, public transport. I mean, what does that mean in practical terms? Which of the big festivals have to move? Does Glastonbury have to go to Bristol, for example? So it's it's not that you would have to move your festival. You could also get a grid connection to your festival. And I what think about the transport realistically to somewhere like Glastonbury. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's possible to to devise transport solutions where you incentivize the lowest carbon options that you have and you and you disincentivize uh, the higher carbon versions. So I don't we aren't we aren't sort of trying to say that every festival needs to move. But I think if you take the sense of this moment of reassembly, this would be a time to consider actually for a long term low carbon future. Is this the right venue for us? Could we, could we, should we be somewhere else? Right across the sector. But for, for festivals where their location is really, you know, a central part of their identity, they of course may not want to do that. So then it's about thinking about, can I get a grid connection? And if not, how do I roll out renewable energy options on site that will track the carbon intensity of the grid so that I'm at least as good as if I did have a grid connection? But, so moving from the grid connection, which I understand, but, but is it really realistic to say you're going to get mass electrified public transport to somewhere like Glastonbury? Reading and Leeds, I can, I can, I, I can believe that that would happen in time, but when, when will that happen in, in Glastonbury? Well, I think, you know, I mean, I'm kind of thinking on the hoop a little bit here because we're not making recommendations to particular festivals. I mean, I think Glastonbury have the answer to that. You know, all these problems, um, all the barriers and issues are best understood by the people that are living with those every day. So I think that, you know, that Glastonbury would give you the, by far the best answer to how that could be done. But thinking about a context like that, how do you shift much more of the transport demand onto, onto trains? And then how do you shuttle people from train stations in a lower carbon way? That would be a much lower carbon option than allowing or encouraging or making it, you know, super easy for lots and lots of people to drive. How do you make that option like the cheapest, funnest, easiest option to do so that it's not like, oh, you know, maybe I just won't bother going because I'll have to I'll have to get this kind of transport. It's like, actually, that transport really works brilliantly well and you get fast tracked entry and you get a better place to pitch your tent. And, you know, there's lots of things you could do to kind of incentivize that. And you've got to work with the, the infrastructure that you do have. And so there are train stations that could then and do have shuttles to, to Glastonbury. 
And on, a, I mean, moving away from that specific case, so obviously many, many councils have now declared a climate emergency and they've adopted their own their own commitments, net, net uh, or zero carbon commitments in many cases. And, and they also license uh, events to take place. I mean, do you expect there's going to be a very large increase in the number of license uh, refusals as a result of this? Well, Rob may know more about this than me from the work that they've, they've been doing in Liverpool, but I'll have, I'll have a bash first. Um, so I think you would expect that logically, wouldn't you? If you've declared uh, a net zero target by 2030 or 2038, then you're going to have to look right across everything that you're doing. I think, you know, in terms of this sort of coalition approach that we've been talking about, how could local authorities work together to, you know, to, to challenge and to require a higher level of performance? What's the role of national government in helping that through the Licensing Act or similar? Um, but how could local authorities work together so that they don't have that fear of losing out to a festival because they're holding it to a higher standard? So could there actually be some collaboration, <coughs> a common approach? If you've declared a climate emergency, these are the things you should be requiring of people holding events in your area. Thank you. Rob, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I think Carly was uh, very precise with that, that answer, to be honest. Thank you. Thank you. Carl, you, you mentioned earlier that the term net zero could be sometimes unhelpful, particularly if it kind of deflects from making actual reductions in carbon emissions. I just wonder if in the case of um, festivals and other events, if the concept of offsetting is really rather more cosmetic than real, because, you know, as a country, we're trying to plant a lot more trees anyway, regardless of what festivals uh, take place. So, I mean, I get the fact that it makes sense to talk about carbon neutrality at a national level, but does it really make sense at the level of one event or is it something of a nonsense? Well, I, I personally am not a fan uh, for some of the reasons you've just outlined. Um, and I, I think it really helps people to own their emissions um, and to own the solutions for continuing to reduce those. If you, if you stay on an emissions reduction reporting rather than a, we have hit net zero, you know, there's very high carbon activities you can do now that are called carbon neutral. Well, if that is genuinely the case, why would we also need to reduce demand for them? We absolutely do need to reduce demand for them because there are limited uh, availability of these offsets and negative emissions and there are uncertainties about them, about them delivering. So I think I would much prefer that events, companies, anyone who's talking about about carbon um, reported on its on its reductions and if it wants to do offsetting um, and to maximize other co benefits from that meeting sustainable development goals then for sure report on that too but but keep them separate and show that downward trajectory and you know we were talking earlier about greenwashing i think that would help the audience see that, that different options are much lower carbon than others and then that would help to kind of create a bit of a a bit of a drive to to not be a kind of laggard in the in the sector and, and finally from me chairman um i mean who who in the sector or the academic in your world the academic world is doing the work on what's a realistic target for a uh, for festivals to, to get to in terms of carbon reduction i mean it does trouble there's a bit of wishful thinking goes on in this like saying all food should be locally sourced and so on i mean how, how would you run a business that you know, ticked along all year round and then for sort of five days the business went bananas and then it and then it stopped again for, for the other 11 and three quarter months i mean that that's why you have businesses that follow big events around the country, music festivals and, and other things. And you can't wish away that, uh, that economic reality. Just like you can't wish away the, the fact that in the, you know, the, uh, the countryside around Glastonbury, you, you know, you're not year round, you're not going to sustain a, you know, a mass electric transport system. So who's doing the work that sets out what is a realistic target to, to get to? So I... I suppose the idea of realistic depends. Um, I think realistic options for delivery of the target that we have committed to nationally is how I would like to frame it. Um, and so I think, you know, organisations like Julie's Bicycle collect and support examples of best practice. So there's some really good practice going on in the sector and some really great examples of, you know, all these areas, energy, waste, uh, local supply chains, so I, I think that that kind of organisation, sector sector led organisation, um, is is able to to provide that. But I think one of the things that the all 
often happens in climate change discussions is we go to kind of the extremes of like banning or we, it couldn't all be local. But, but there are lots of decisions you could take to make it more local than it is, make mm -hmm. it more sustainable than it is. And it's about that journey of saying, well, and, and what more could we do? And what more could we do on a year on year basis? So I think sometimes if you're trying to get to zero straight away or you know, completely doing something uh, like, like all local traders in one year, yeah, that seems very challenging. Um, but can you constantly reassess whether you could do more in these areas where you've got some principles and goals that you want to achieve then yes, I think you can do that and you can shift in that direction significantly and urgently. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Clive Efford? Yes, I mean, part of the question I was going to ask you, uh, uh, Carly, uh, has, has been answered. Uh, but um, what more can local authorities do about the, the venues for festivals to make them more carbon neutral? Um, uh, you make the point about them cooperating uh, better, and that was a question I was going to ask you. Should they Do we set a criteria or standard by which a location for a festival is approved? Um, but, 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 I mean, for instance, if there's a regular spot that's used, should they be making sure that infrastructure is in there for renewable energy uh, and you know and things like that, like that and water sources and and stuff? So, uh, what, what, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, so local authorities, I think, have got a really central role to play, and they work. They, they often work very closely with their district network operators or their electricity system, for example. So that would be one of the key stakeholders for any DNO making plans for its network. So thinking about where do we where do we want supply or the places we would like to use for festivals that we don't currently have supply, and could that be built into to future plans? But I think that collaboration and standard is 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 important. I also think examples like what Rob's doing in Liverpool are really exciting because they potentially give people um, like a, a kind of plan for how you could do it. And so sharing that, like if you come if you come to us, we can help you have a super low carbon gig because we've tried it, we've tested it, we've iterated it, and now we know how to do it. So I, th I think they could do a, a range of things to, to help those in the sector who would really like to accelerate fast, but also to make sure there's a sort of minimum standard that they're looking for. Is there a danger that um, in the absence of a standard where they all approve a, a set of criteria, um, that, that, um, that they get, if they, if they put these measures in place, it adds to cost perhaps or makes it more awkward, that they lose out. So do we get a sort of competition to go to the sort of lowest common denominator. So it's race to the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think I think it's a potential risk. Um, you know, I feel like I'm uncharacteristically optimistic today. I think if we looked at it the other way around, you could say um, might 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 uh, festival organisers want to go to the cities that really help them or the local authorities that really help them run a super low carbon event. So there could be something about that you appeal to people and bring them in in that way. I think the leakage thing is maybe helped, you know, the sort of race to the bottom idea is maybe helped by having that coalition, but also I suppose whether at a national level that needs to be instigated so that there isn't a, you know, a race to the bottom and you find somewhere that's not declared a climate emergency and not doing anything. So I think that balance between what can local authorities do and what can national government do to help them has to be found. And it probably needs a bit more investigation to work out what the balance is there. So, 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 Rob, um, uh, is the industry uh, demanding enough of the venue uh, providers to to say we want you to set these high standards so that we'll, you know we can comply more and be more carbon neutral? Does it need to do more, the industry? Well, I'm hoping that the the sort of the experiment with Liverpool is also very much a collaboration with the Liverpool City Council and Liverpool Culture, in the sense that we're all working together to sort of not only look at how the transportation to and from the venues managed, how the power is managed across the whole of the project, but also which, which groups we work with, which, which identities, which, which um, corporate sponsors we work with. That's really important, I think, because when you start to get a collaborative partnership with the right corporate identities and the right local council sort of like authorities, you end up with a very simple system to work with. We've already found in the last year alone by looking at these six principles for Liverpool, how to how to sort of you know deal with transportation, how to deal with energy, how to deal with landfill, waste, and food. That working with the right identities, everything's everything's achievable. And I think that's half of the problem, really. It's like looking at 
where you find which partnerships you create you know and i think we've we found across this that working with liverpool as a partner as opposed to just working with a promoter in isolation it makes this this whole project a lot more uh, realistic you know as an achievable target okay i've got no more questions yet thank you thank you clive Shit. that concludes our first panel thank you professor Colin McLaughlin and Robert Del Nia for your evidence today. It's been most illuminating. Thank you. We're going Thanks to take so a short break now uh, for two minutes as we set up our second panel. Order, order. <laughs>